take a lens, because it's a lens that has an image plane, an object plane, and you can put uh, a camera in the image plane and look at something in the object plane. And with that arrangement, you can get a nice image. Now, if you move the camera outside of that image plane, but leave the lens untouched, what you can see is that you don't take an image of the object anymore, but actually of a plane that is behind the object. And the same holds when you put the camera uh, below the image plane. So now the idea is, can we put all of these planes that we just generated with the camera next to each other? And it turns out, yes, we can do that. We just need to make sure that we have different path lengths of the distance from the lens to the image plane. And that is easy to do with just some beam splitters. We can do the same thing also in a microscopy setting. And that has a very important um, implication. The reason is you can see that the, the cell that I took a picture of here, that is visible in the other two planes, but it shouldn't. And ideally we want to get rid of this. And in microscopy, we can actually do that because of fluorescence. So if you take a dichroic filter and you shine in blue light and the sample is labeled with special fluorophores, they will emit green light and we can separate them out. And that's the trick we will use now. For that, we add another mirror into our setup and make our light not completely flooding the whole scene, but actually a sheet of light that we scan really, really quickly through our sample. So when we scan that through and the camera is running at the same time, then if we are fast enough, the camera doesn't notice that something is moving and we record the full volume. When you have your um, different planes, then the intersection in any moment of time that you can see in um, in green and red and blue here, that is put into a single line. And that is the line that we will read out every single instance of time. And that is moving through the sample as the galvanometric scan mirror is turning. And at the same time, the fluorescence is de-scanned on the camera because of this rolling shutter. Um, let's have a closer look why actually that gives us optical sectioning. For that, you have to realize that there is not just light coming from these different planes, but it's actually light that goes through all of the other planes as well. On our camera side, it would look a bit like this. The places where the light sheet goes through, there you have the most intense light. But also, all the light from, say, the red plane is blurring into the other ones. But the, the key point is, it's blurring. All the autofocus light is very spread out. If we scan through our sample with the light sheet and have a global exposure, all that light is still there and just adds up. But if you have a rolling shutter, then it doesn't really matter. All the light that is blurring over from the sides is blocked by the rolling shutter. So we only get minimal autofocus light and all the things we are recording, that is actually in focus light. That's how it works. And in practice, it looks like this. You can scan with basically the frame rate of the camera through a sample and you get optical sectioning. In the top, you can see a normal cell with actin stain and the bottom, same cell, but now we triggered the camera and the light sheet at the same time. You can do the same thing in a different sample. This is mitochondria in heart tissue. And you can see that we can see all the different little mitochondrial networks in there. Every single frame that you can see here, that's actually a volume. It spans about two micrometers and we can color code that in the case where we don't control our camera together with our light sheet, we see nothing. If we control them together, then you can see everything. And that quite deep into the sample. If you want to find out more, this paper just came out. Very happy about it. And please have a look if you're interested.